Griffin, it's time to play. I'm ready. Ah! Good afternoon, folks and goats, and welcome back to the Command Valley for another episode of Duel of the Peaks. I believe we are on episode four. Joining me today is Peter. Hey, guys. And we will be doing the play-by-plays and the commentary throughout this game. A quick reminder that this podcast and this episode is sponsored by GameGrid. If you are looking for any cards for your Commander decks, then feel free to head on over to the link in the description box below to head on over to their website and order their cards and get them delivered directly to your house. Helps us out and it supports them in the process. Win-win. But the biggest win is by supporting us on patreon.com slash commandvalley. Check it out, consider joining one of our awesome tiers and getting access to the exclusive benefits thereof. A brief overview of the game today, we are now on episode 4, so all of the cards in our decks are including Cal Time and Time Spiral Remastered. However, the players have had a chance to revamp their decks after game 3, still using the same commanders. And then next episode, episode 5, will be using the Strix Heaven cards. Before we begin the game, allow me to let the players introduce their decks, how they've changed it, and we'll go on from there. I'll start by introducing mine. Peter is going to be playing Grenzo Dungeon Warden. After his last game, he decided to spice his deck up quite a lot and completely rebuilt it as a Relentless Rats deck. So this deck has 32 copies of Relentless Rats, and the goal is to reanimate them from the bottom of the library really easily with Grenzo and be able to outvalue our opponents by the sheer amount of rats we're able to get onto the field at once. As a side note, no one knows that I have changed it to Relentless Rats, so this is going to be a big surprise for everyone when the first one comes out onto the battlefield. I've intentionally kept it a secret. Peter's opening hand consists of two snow-covered swamps, Varagoth Blood Sky Sire, and four Relentless Rats. Now let's hand it over to Caleb and Landon to introduce their decks. Hey guys, Landon here, and today I have brought back my same Tasigur list that I used in the last episode. I decided that I liked the way that the deck was, and I just kind of felt like I didn't get a super great hand or I didn't get a super great start, so I kept the list pretty much the same. So this deck is all about just using Tassiger to accrue as much value as possible. He comes down super early if you can fill your graveyard, and his activated ability of milling two and returning a card from my graveyard to my hand of my of an opponent's choice. It's a really powerful ability. As far as what this deck is trying to do, like I said, get power out Tassiger and get that card advantage engine going. This deck is also meant to be just kind of a, a Sultai good stuff slash Sultai control deck. There is so much removal in here. As far as finishers go, I'm really just banking on like a consuming aberration that gets super swell or maybe Coma or a Vorinclex, just some type of big beater, maybe even Tassiger beats. So my opening hand today was a forest, a Dryad Arbor, a Tomb Stalker, Search for Tomorrow, Coma, Cosmos Serpent, Laboratory Maniac, and an Ice Tunnel. Hey everyone, this is Caleb. I am still playing Alesha, who smiles at death. She has the ability to bring back my creatures with power two or less from the yard, and the main goals of my deck are to either run over my opponents with super powerful flying angels, or combo off with Kiki Jiki. I haven't changed anything in my deck from the last game as I am pretty confident with my build. My opening hand for this game consisted of Blight Step Pathway, Snow Covered Swamp, Snow Covered Plains, Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker, Palace Jailer, Rise of the Dreadmarn, and Read the Bones. Hello guys, Griffin here, still playing Joria of the Gitu. Had a lot of fun with this deck, so I'm excited to bring it to the table again for episode 4. This deck has not changed at all. It's the same same kind of thing. I'm trying to suspend high CMC cards, cheat them into play, get around those high casting mana costs, and also I've got the combos in. But I'm also focusing around that reiterate extra turn value engine, so we'll see if that pops off this game. My opening hand was an island, Sirtland Frostpire, Mountain, Aeon Chronicler, Magus of the Future, Boom Bust, and Ulrin's Epiphany. And with that, let's begin the game. Peter will be doing the play-by-play, and then Griffin, me, will be doing the side-by-side commentary. Peter will start us out. He draws and plays a snow-covered swamp and passes to Caleb. Caleb draws and also plays a snow-covered swamp and passes to Landon. 
Landon draws, plays a forest, and then taps it to suspend a Search for Tomorrow with two time counters on it. You know, I feel like Search for Tomorrow is a really underrated card. I really like it, especially on a turn one suspend. Griffin draws and plays a Certain Frost Pyre tapped and passes. Peter draws and plays another snow-covered swamp. He then taps two to foretell a card and passes. Caleb will draw, play a snow-covered plains, and then also tap two to foretell a card. He then passes to Landon. Landon untaps, removes a time counter from Search for Tomorrow, and draws. He then plays Ice Tunnel tapped and passes to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws, plays a mountain, and taps two to foretell a card as well. This is uh, seeming pretty similar to the first game where all we were doing on turn two was suspending cards. Peter untaps, draws, and misses his land drop, unfortunately, so he has to pass the turn. Caleb untaps and draws, plays a snow-covered mountain, then taps three for read the bones. He will scry two, keep them on top, and then draw them, and then he loses two life. He then passes to Landon. Lennon untaps, and the last counter of Search for Tomorrow is removed, so he casts it for free and searches for a swamp onto the battlefield untapped. He then draws for turn, plays a Dryad Arbor as his land for turn, and then taps three for Laboratory Maniac. He then passes. Good old classic lab man. Easy to note that um, this is Lennon's pet card. Griffin untaps and draws. He plays an island, then taps two for a Prismatic Lens. He then passes to Peter. Peter untaps and draws, plays a snow-covered mountain, then pays three mana for Varagoth, Blood Sky Sire. He then passes to Caleb. Varagoth is a very scary card to see on turn three. I mean, we all knew when Kaldheim released that Varagoth would be a scary card, but, you know, you never really think about how it comes out on turn three and what scary things can come up. Caleb untaps and draws, plays a Great Hall of Starnheim tapped, and then taps two to foretell a card and passes the turn back to Landon. Landon untaps and draws, and he will also miss his land drop, unfortunately having to pass the turn. Griffin untaps and draws, he taps one for Ponder, rearranges the top three cards of his library, and draws a card. He then plays a Mountain for turn, and then taps out to cast Kozuma, God of the Voyage. He then passes to Peter. Peter untaps and draws, he pays two to cast his commander, Grenzo Dungeon Warden, which will enter with no plus one plus one counters because he didn't pay anything into X. He then plays a snow-covered swamp and goes to combat. He swings Varagoth at Landon. Landon will block with his Laboratory Maniac, which will die. Moving to his second main phase, Peter taps two to activate Varagoth's ability, searching for a card and putting it on top of his library. He then passes to Caleb. And there we go, seeing Varagoth's ability already doing some work. The table just has to wonder what Peter tutored to the top of his library this early in the game. Caleb untaps and draws, he plays a snow-covered mountain, then pays 5 for Fira, Judge of Valor, a feat that Landon was unable to do two games ago. He then passes. Landon untaps and draws, plays a woodland chasm tapped, and then he delves away two cards and taps out to cast Tassiker, the Golden Fang, from the command zone. He then passes to Griffin. Griffin untaps, chooses not to exile Kozuma, and draws a card. He then casts Joyra for 3, leaving up 2 mana, and passes. Turn 6, Peter untaps and draws. He again misses his land drop and passes the turn. We are all missing land drops in this game. It, it, it's, it's pretty nice to have everybody miss a land drop. Except for Caleb. Caleb's doing great. Caleb untaps and draws. He plays down a seer step pathway, then pays 3 for Alesha, who smiles at death. He then goes to combat, swinging Fira at Griffin for 2. He takes 2, and Caleb gains 2 from the lifelink. He then pays 3 for his own Varagoth Blood Sky Sire, and that will trigger Fira, looking at the top 3, putting one into his hand and the others into his graveyard. He then passes to Landon. Landon untaps and draws. He pays 5 for a Consuming Aberration. He will then pass the turn, and at his end step, Griffin suspends an Aeon Chronicler using Joyra's ability. Griffin untaps, and in his upkeep, he removes a time counter from Aeon Chronicler and draws a card. He will choose to exile Kozuma at this point, and then he will draw his card for turn. He will play an island as his land for turn, which will trigger Kozuma getting him a counter. He then passes, and at the end step, Peter activates Grenzo twice to get a relentless rats from the bottom of his library. Peter, I just want to tell you how happy I was to see a relentless rats come onto the battlefield. I just, I felt like... I could just have conceded that game right there. You you won this game turn what is this? Turn 6. <laughs> well, well thank you. 
I wanted to keep it a surprise from everyone so that the first rat that came out, it was like, oh my gosh, it, you know. Relentless rats. <laughs> someone's playing re relentless rats. Peter then goes to his turn, untaps and draws. He pays three for a relentless rat from his hand, and then he goes to combat. He swings one relentless rat at Griffin and Varagoth at Caleb. Caleb blocks with Alesha, who has first strike, which will take Varagoth out. But before that, Peter responds by activating his boast ability, searching for a card and putting it on top of his library. Varagoth then dies, and Griffin does not block and takes three. Peter will then pass the turn. Caleb untaps and draws, plays down a snow-covered plains, and then goes to combat. Varagoth swings at Griffin, and Fiera swings at Peter. No blocks, Griffin and Peter will both take two. He then activates Varagoth's boast ability to find a card and put it on top of his library. He then pays four for Palace Jailer to become the monarch and exile Landon's consuming aberration until he isn't the monarch. He then passes and draws a card from being the monarch. Very welcome to see the monarch in this game. I uh, was excited to see Palace Jailer from Time Spiral remastered because it just really makes a game of Commander so much fun to have that Monarch in play. Lennon untaps and draws. He plays a Forest, and then he taps four for binding the old gods to destroy that palace jailer. He then goes to combat, swinging Tassiger at Caleb, who takes it, going down to 38, and then on damage, Lennon will become the Monarch, which returns the Consuming Aberration to the battlefield under his control. He then passes and draws a card from the Monarch, and in response to his end step, Griffin suspends a Magus of the Future, Riddle of Lightning, and Boom Bust. Now you might be thinking, Griffin, are you about to blow up everybody's lands? And the answer is yes, absolutely I am. Griffin then untaps, he removes time counters from all of his suspended cards, drawing a card from the Aeon Chronicler, and then draws his card for turn. He plays a Mountain, which will trigger Kozuma, he adds a counter to it, and then he passes. I want to know everybody's what, everybody's actual feelings about Boom Bust and how they were planning to play around that. Because I don't think I heard much of that in the game, so <laughs> I'm curious. What did you think about the Boom Bust? I, w I don't think I was as worried as the other two were. I think Lennon and Caleb were definitely worried because they definitely complained about it quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Peter starts his turn eight, untapping and drawing. He plays a snow-covered swamp, and then he pays six to cast two more relentless rats. He goes to combat, swinging one rat at Caleb and one rat at Griffin. Neither block, and both will take five. He then passes to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws, he plays a snow-covered swamp, and then goes straight into combat. He swings Alesha and Varagoth at Landon. On attack, Alesha will trigger, he pays 2, and he targets the Palace Jailer to return to the battlefield attacking Landon as well. With that trigger on the stack, Landon casts Mystic Reflection, choosing to have the next creature that enters the battlefield come in as a copy of Dryad Arbor. This will also trigger Consuming Aberration. Each opponent will mill until they get a land, adding a total of 9 power to Consuming Aberration. The Palace Jailer then enters as a Dryad Arbor. Landon chooses to block Alesha, with the Consuming Aberration, which will send Alesha back to the command zone, and then Landon takes three. From the combat damage, Caleb will retake the Monarch. Definitely quite an impactful turn. Caleb thought he was going to get rid of that Consuming Aberration for the second time, but with Lennon's crafty Mystic Reflection, which, by the way, is a very underrated card, and I, I do play it in many of my blue decks, it really can mess up very many plans, and we can see it in play here. In his second main phase, he activates Varagoth's boast ability to get a card from his library to the top of his library. While he searches, Griffin and Caleb are scheming on a way to get rid of the Relentless Rats. Caleb says he has a way to get rid of one of them if Griffin can take care of the rest. He then passes and draws a card from the Monarch. Lennon untaps and draws. The Binding of the Old Gods triggers its second chapter. He searches for a Rhymewood Falls onto the battlefield tapped. He then taps two for Everflowing Chalice, entering with one counter on it. That triggers Consuming Aberration. Each opponent mills until they get a land, bringing Consuming Aberration's power up to 24. He then declines to go to combat in interest of holding up blockers for the rats. He passes, and in his end step, Griffin suspends Certland Elementalist using Joyra. Griffin untaps, and in his upkeep, he removes more time counters, draws a card from Aeon Chronicler, and then he draws his card from turn. Griffin has a plan to get rid of the rats, and it's Battle of Frost and Fire, which does four damage to each creature on the battlefield that's not a giant. So he just needs Caleb to get rid of one of the rats, and it would work because then the rats would be four fours. 
However, it would also take out all of Caleb's stuff, which Caleb is fine with, but the card that he would play to get rid of a rat would be one of his combo pieces, which is Restoration Angel, that he couldn't get back with Alesha. And so he can't play it before the board wipe, nor after, and still keep his combo piece. Lannan offers to take care of one of Peter's rats at the price that Griffin can't use the bust half of Boom Bust, and Griffin declines. The goal here is to get rid of the Relentless Rats, not to stop me from blowing up everybody's lands. That was very rude, Landon. Griffin will then delve some cards away and cast Treasure Cruise to draw three cards. He plays an island as his land for turn, which will trigger Kozuma. He returns it to the battlefield with two counters on it, and he draws two cards. He then pays three for Coalition Relic and pays two to foretell a card. He then passes the turn to Peter, having not cast his board wipe to take care of the rats. Peter untaps and draws. He pays five for a Vanquisher's Banner choosing rats so that all of his rats get plus one plus one and whenever he casts a rat he draws a card. Shocker. He then goes to combat swinging four six six relentless rats at Griffin. I wonder why you did that. <laughs> oh yeah I, I remember now it's because I was worried about the bust. <laughs> <laughs> Griffin will block with Joyra and Kozuma, which will both die, and then he takes 12. He then passes, and at the end step, Caleb casts his Restoration Angel, bouncing the Palace Jailer to return it to the battlefield, and that targets one of Peter's rats to exile until Caleb is no longer the monarch. Lennon has interaction for this, and he wants to use it because Caleb is about to win the game here. He's guessing. He's guessing that he has that Kikijiki into his hand for that infinite combo, but he says he can wait as long as Caleb doesn't target his stuff, and Caleb doesn't. Caleb then goes to his turn, untaps, and draws. He plays a snow-covered swamp and then pays five for Kaya the Inexorable. He activates her plus one to put a ghost form counter on Restoration Angel to protect it from a board wipe. He then goes to combat swinging Palace Jailer and Varagoth at Peter and Fira and Restoration Angel at Landon. Peter blocks the Jailer with Grenzo, both will die, and then Peter takes two and Landon takes five. Caleb goes to his second main and taps four for Damnation. Landon responds to this by tapping five for Mystic Confluence, targeting the Damnation to counter it and draw two cards. This triggers the Consuming Aberration, each opponent mills until they find a land again, and then Damnation is countered because Caleb can't pay the three, and Landon draws the two cards. Caleb, not very satisfied with his turn, passes to Landon. This was actually a pretty clutch play by Landon. Same thing with the Mystic Reflection, honestly, with Landon kind of being the police of this game. But I was hoping that Damnation was going to go off, because I didn't have very many creatures anyway, and I wanted to get rid of those Relentless Rats and uh, the, the Restoration Angel, so it's a very, very interesting play by Landon to cast that uh, that counter spell for the Damnation. Landon untaps and draws. He triggers, binding the Old Gods, and each of his creatures will gain Death Touch until end of turn. He then pays 3 to cast Courser of Crufix, letting him play with the top card of his library revealed. That will trigger Consuming Aberration. Each opponent mills, bringing its total power to 36. He then goes to combat, swinging the Aberration and Tassiger at Peter for lethal. Peter will go to zero, and he is out of the game. Rip in peace, Peter. Rip in peace, Peter. I've got to say, there's nothing that makes me sadder than the Relentless Rats not taking over this game. And for <laughs> you to go first is just heartbreaking, and my heart goes out to you. Yeah, I felt I felt my... Um... I felt my game to suddenly turn onto a clock because I played Relentless Rats and everyone's like, oh no, those are going to get huge. We better deal with him fast. And so it was it was a lot like seeing your, your boom bust over there. Everyone just saw me as an immediate threat. And that's totally fine. I think that means that I built a good deck and it was a fun game and it was really fun to see everyone's reactions to me pulling out a Relentless Rats out of nowhere. I am going to describe your deck in this Duel of the Peaks episode as the Romeo and Juliet, where the story of it was so happy, but it just wasn't enough to stop from a very fateful defeat. Absolutely. And I think, honestly, if I would have had better luck with the lands, I think things would have gone differently, but it is what it is. Just wanted I to see you kill somebody with rats. <laughs> Me too. I, I wanted to kill someone with rats. Rip in peace. Rip in peace, Peter. With nothing left, Landon passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps. In his upkeep, he removes time counters, and he casts the Aeon Chronicler for free and draws a card from removing its last time counter. 
He then draws his card for turn, plays an island, and goes straight into combat, swinging Aeon Chronicler at Kaya for six, taking her out. He then pays six for a foretold Alrun's Epiphany. With no responses on the table, he then casts Reiterate to copy the Alrun's Epiphany, not having enough mana to buy it back. So he will just take two extra turns and create four birds. Kind of getting flashbacks from the last game of Duel of the Peaks, but I wasn't in a commanding enough position to be able to go off and take eight extra turns like I did last time, so we'll have to settle for just two extra turns, which is a bummer. He then taps the Coalition Relic to add a charge counter to it, and then passes going to his second turn. He untaps, and during his upkeep, he removes time counters from all of his suspended cards. Three of them will remove their last time counter so he can cast them in any order. He will start by casting Riddle of Lightning, choosing Caleb. He will then scry three, he'll keep all of them on top, and he will reveal a Goldspan Dragon dealing five to Caleb's face. He then casts the Boom Half of Boom Bust to blow up Caleb's Seer Step Pathway and one of his own mountains. This prevents Caleb from being able to cast Kikijiki on his next turn and win. I know everyone was probably looking forward to me blowing up everybody's lands. However, as is such in a game of Commander, there's a lot of politics going on, and it seemed like I just wanted the reaction of everybody seeing my bust, but I wasn't ending up going to blow up everybody's lands. In hindsight, I should've, so I am so sorry about this. Finally, he casts his Magus of the Future, which will let him play with the top card of his library revealed, and he can play cards from the top of his library. He then draws his card for turn. Coalition Relic will trigger, and he will add a red mana to his mana pool. He'll then pay four more to cast Goldspan Dragon. He adds to combat, swinging Goldspan Dragon and his four birds at Landon, and Magus of the Future and Aeon Chronicler at Caleb. On attack, Goldspan Dragon will make him a treasure, and then neither of them block, both going down to 23 life. Griffin will gain the Monarch from dealing combat damage to Caleb from this attack. He then pays two for Think Twice from the top of his library to draw a card, and then pays two more for a Foretold Behold the Multiverse, scrying two to the bottom and drawing two. He pays three for a Replicating Ring, and then passes, drawing a card for the Monarch, and goes to his third turn. He untaps, and in his upkeep, removes the last time counter from Certainland Elementalist, casting it for free. He adds a counter to his replicating ring during his upkeep as well, and then he draws a card for turn. He heads straight into combat, swinging the Elementalist, Goldspan Dragon, and the Birds at Landon, and Magus of the Future and Aeon Chronicler at Caleb. He creates a treasure on attack from the Goldspan Dragon, and then Certainland Elementalist triggers, casting a 4C for free to scry 4. He puts one on the bottom and leaves the rest on top and then he draws two cards. Landon blocks the Elementalist with his Corsair of Crufix, takes nine, and then Caleb takes 11. In his second main phase, he'll pay two for a Jorah's Time Bug. He will then pay one for a Time Bender, and then he will pay four for a Shiv and Sand Mage, which has no targets when it enters. He'll play his Island as his land for turn, and then he passes, drawing a card for the Monarch. Yeah, I, th I believe this was a very impactful turn uh, I did a lot of stuff, I got a lot of stuff out, but it, it it seemed like I didn't go from commanding to a win, I just went from behind to ahead, which isn't really one where you want to be with two extra turns, but I, I casted what I had, I, I did everything I could, so this is just where I ended up. Going to turn 10, Caleb untaps and draws. He will then tap 4 for a Solemn Simulacrum to find a snow-covered mountain onto the battlefield tapped. That will get him his mana that he needs to cast Kikijiki on his next turn. He then passes, and in his end step, Landon activates Tassigur to mill 2, and he chooses Caleb to return something to his hand. Instead of returning the Mystic Reflection like he promised earlier, he returns Mystic Confluence to Landon's hand. This is hopefully to deal with the stuff on Griffin's board. This turn rotation was extremely tense. Every single player was kind of prepping themselves to win, and it, it was there was a lot of table talk, there was a lot of discussion about who's going to deal with what and how we could mitigate all the threats. So it was very interesting to see all the politics going on because, yeah, at this point, Landon, Griffin, and Caleb are all trying to run that last distance to cross the finish line. Landon then goes to his turn, untapping and drawing. He taps five for Mystic Confluence to attempt to bounce Griffin's three untapped creatures. 
Griffin responds by casting Draining Welk to counter it and give the Welk five plus one plus one counters, countering the confluence. Disappointed, Landon passes to Griffin. This was a very interesting play by Landon. A little bit of insight into the game. Landon was trying to see whether he should keep his Mystic Confluence up for Caleb's board, knowing that he has the combo in his hand but makes the assessment that Griffin is the one that needs to be taken care of, so he needs to get rid of whatever's on his board so he can swing him and take him out, but the risk is if Griffin has any kind of counter spell or any kind of reaction, it all falls apart, and it did fall apart. Griffin will untap. In his upkeep, he'll give a counter to Replicating Ring, and then he will draw. He pays four for careful consideration, drawing four cards and discarding two lands. He then goes to combat swinging Goldspan Dragon 4, Birds, and Draining Welk at Caleb for 14 to try to take him out. He creates a treasure from Goldspan Dragon and then casts Mystic Confluence before blockers are declared, targeting Caleb's two flyers and Landon's consuming aberration to bounce back to their hand. Landon responds to this by activating Tassiger, milling two, and Caleb gives him back the Mystic Confluence again. After that resolves, Caleb will cast a Silence to stop Griffin from casting any more spells this turn. Mystic Confluence then resolves, returning Fira and Restoration Angel to Caleb's hand, and Consuming Aberration to Landon's hand. Caleb then casts an Angel's Grace to save him from death, and Caleb takes 14, preventing 3 of it so he only goes down to 1. What a massive, massive play by Caleb to use that silence before using the Angel's Grace to make sure that Griffin can't cast any spells. That was an extremely important play because even if Griffin had a counter spell, he would have to counter the silence and wouldn't have been able to counter the Angel's Grace. So Caleb, that was incredibly clutch and that might have just saved you the entire game. He then plays an island from the top of his library, and then he passes drawing a card from the monarch. Caleb untaps and draws, and attempts to start his combo. He pays 6 for Kikijiki Mirror Breaker. He'll then pay 4 for Restoration Angel, targeting Kikijiki when it enters to exile it and bring it back. No responses from the others, so Caleb combos off and makes a billion Restoration Angels. How it works, just so everyone knows, is that Kikijiki will tap and make a copy of Restoration Angel with haste, which will exile Kikijiki and bring it back to the battlefield, which will then tap to copy Restoration Angel again and infinitely loop until he has enough Restoration Angels that he can swing out at everybody and win the game. Rip in peace, Landon, and rip in peace, Griffin. How does it feel to have a uh, billion restoration angels swinging at your face the thing is the sad thing is and this this i'm saying this to all of you edh players out there if you have anything in your hand even if it's just drawing a couple of cards you do it i had a draw three spell graven lore in my hand the last card on top of my library that I could have played with Megas of the Future was a Pact of Negation, Ooh. but I didn't do it because I thought it was over, and that was just heartbreaking. Oh, that Absolutely hurts. heartbreaking. Yeah. Oh, man. So, lesson to all of you. Just play out all the ends. Do all the things that you can. Things would have gone so differently. That's ridiculous. Yes, but Caleb absolutely deserved to win that game. Uh, yeah. We were all expecting to see the combo, and he played around it so masterfully in the way that he bounced his stuff back to his hand, that he used that Angel's Grace when he was about to die. Just so many careful considerations that he made for him to be able to take that win. So congratulations, Caleb. Congrats, Caleb. And I know that you were really gunning for that Kiki-Jiki combo for the whole time that it was in your deck. So I'm I'm proud of you for finally pulling it off. And we see a, our first combo win for Duel of the Peaks. That's really nice. Very, very cool. Well, I'll share my post-game thoughts first, uh, being the first one wiped out of the game. I had so much fun with this game, trying to pull off the Relentless Rat strategy and getting as many out as I could. I started with a lot in my hand, and so that was a really good advantage for me. I had a lot of fun building this deck. It was the first time I had built a deck with multiple copies of a single card. A lot of fun to play. The only downside was that I was really suffering on the land side. I only had six lands, I think, at the end of the game. And so I had a whole bunch of four or five mana costing spells in my hand that I couldn't do anything with. And so I was just trying to play optimally and everything and couldn't get the lands that I needed. And I think another big mistake was swinging Varagoth at Alesha earlier in the game and it getting wiped out because of first strike. So that hurt and 
anyways, it was a good game. I'm sad to have been taken out first, but I totally understand when you're sitting across the table from a deck with 32 Relentless Rats in it. You got to do what you got to do. <laughs> it's a sign of respect, Peter. Oh, I know. I know. And I had a lot of fun. I was I was laughing to the end. I <laughs> This was a really fun game. That was one of the funnest games I've ever played. Yeah. What about you, Griffin? What are your post-game thoughts? This game was one of the funnest games of Commander I've played in a long time. Everybody had such a powerful start. The Consuming Aberration, the Vergoth, the Relentless Rat, seeing that Restoration Angel. I mean, everybody was doing stuff. It was just so fun to just dirtle the entire game, draw so many cards. And, you know, I had the, the extra turn spells. I had the bus that was going to go off. I was very close to the win, and it just didn't feel bad at all. I just loved this game entirely, uh, and I'm, I'm very excited for, for this to continue. I might just keep playing Joyra because I'm starting to fall in love with this this brew. But I definitely, pr props to you, Peter, the Relentless Rats was my favorite thing that has ever happened on this podcast. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I probably won't be playing it next time, but... <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, not to spoil the next build that I have, but it doesn't have black in it. So, uh, yeah. Passing off to Lennon and Caleb about their post game thoughts. So, that was quite the game. A lot happened during that game. There were a lot of ups and a lot of downs. I really felt like at the end, it really was anybody's game. Peter getting knocked out super early was unfortunate. I feel like his deck really did have quite a threatening board state, so I think swinging in at him with my Consuming Aberration and, and taking him out of the game was the right choice. Congratulations to Caleb on, on coming out on top with that win. I think he picked the perfect time to combo off. He was really patient, and I, I think he definitely had a lot of times in the game where he maybe could have given up or not tried as hard, but I'm really proud of him for sticking it all the way to the end. I've been really pleased with how the meta has been developing. Kaldheim was a super slow-paced, and the addition of Time Spiral really quickened up the gameplay. Super excited to see what Strixhaven has in store for us. I think we're in for a real treat. I think the games are going to be kind of hectic. I'm really looking forward to that. And all in all, I'm really happy with how my Tasker deck played. I think I spent a lot of my resources being kind of the policeman at the table, which, you know, it is what it is. That's kind of what the deck was meant to do. And I'm hoping that Strixhaven introduces some new cards to this deck to make it a little bit better. I think I'm going to keep Tasker. So, hey guys, Caleb again. I am super happy to have won this game. Kiki Jiki is such a crazy card, and it was a super intense game. And I really did not think that I was going to come out on top because, first of all, I thought that Consuming Aberration was coming for me. Unfortunately, Peter had to die to it, and I absolutely love playing against his Relentless Rats deck, so it was sad to see him go, but I think that Landon was smart to take him out because that Relentless Rats deck is absolutely nuts. I love it. But I'm also really glad that Griffin didn't end up busting because there's no way, absolutely no way that I could have come back from that. So anyway, I had a ton of fun, and... I'm just really glad that I was able to get my Kiki Jiki combo off. Thank you, Landon and Caleb. Now, Griffin, let's talk about play of the game. What do you think? I mean, I'm sure it's hard to debate that the play of the game was definitely Caleb's play with that silence into the Angel's Grace. Just very well executed. It was just so wise to play it in that way, making sure that it baited out any counter spells to save his life to make sure he had that win at the at the, the very next turn. I kids just can't see an argument for anything else being the play of the game yeah completely catching griffin off guard you know did not being able to deal with what he had just done and it was it was a really clutch play and he won the next turn you know yeah you could say that that play won him the game in a sense so well, absolutely absolutely very strong play uh now peter what did you think was the mvp card of the game i i I'm having a hard time deciding on this. For On the one hand, we have multiple Varagoths that were on the table at a time, and they were tutoring lots of cards to the top of the library. I know that Caleb was using it to get his combo pieces. I know that I was using it to get value pieces and lands and other things that I needed. So both of those Varagoths were doing a lot of work. On another hand, Landon had that consuming aberration that kept on milling his opponents and getting huge, and that knocked me out of the game. That one card on its own took me out of the game. And so 
between Varagoth and Kasuri Aberration, I'm having a hard time choosing. But what about you, Griffin? What do you think? A hundred percent. Any day that you ask me, it was Relentless Rats. <laughs> the 32 copies of Relentless Rats. That is the card of the game. I will hear none else. There will be no further questions. <laughs> well, there you have it. <laughs> On a more serious note, not that Relentless Rats is not serious. I think the the card of the game is going to be that Consuming Aberration. Mm. I think that was the thing that most players were scared of the most. That's the thing that, I, especially me, that I was playing around a lot, making sure I didn't have just one blocker. I needed to have four. Because of that Mystic Confluence that Lannan had in his graveyard, I needed to play around that. So it definitely was a scary card the entire time was out. I definitely underestimated it, and it, in between my turn and the turn that he attacked me and killed me, it went up, you know, 15 power or something like that, and it was it just has this ability to get ridiculously powerful really fast. And Lennon has a lot of removal spells, a lot of ways to get rid of creatures, so you just never know when it would come and hit you in the face and take you out. Absolutely. Very, very powerful card in his deck. All right, let's go to our scoreboard. So Griffin is at two wins, and Peter and Caleb are tied at one, with Landon still waiting to nab a win. All aboard Team Griffin. Choo-choo. 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 But now everybody on Team Caleb is rejoicing with that very, very wonderful combo win. Absolutely. I can't wait for next game. I'm really excited to see what we use to... um, upgrade our decks and and really take this experiment to the next level absolutely and just a reminder that episode five will be a renewed game we are playing with strixhaven cards which allows us as players to switch commanders so you'll be seeing a lot of cards from strixhaven and a lot of new commanders from strixhaven as well so stay tuned for that coming out soon there's also all of the mystical archive cards that are included in our meta because they can be found in packs and so you can expect a lot of higher power gameplay because of a lot of the really good cards that are found there all right that's it for our fourth episode of duel of the peaks if you liked this episode go ahead and leave us a like and a comment telling us what you like about this kind of format and what we're doing here i can feel the power level really ramping up with decks like this the fact that we can have a relentless rats deck at the table really awesome and so we'd love to hear what you think this episode is possible due to our patrons Thank you so much to everyone who has subscribed to our Patreon and hangs out with us all the time on Discord and plays games with us. Really helps us bounce ideas and get better at playing our game while also getting some sweet perks themselves. You're the best patrons. I wouldn't be here without you. It's a really great community to be a part of, and and we're really appreciative of all of you. And also a reminder that this episode and this podcast is brought to you by GameGrid. So thanks, shout outs to them. Make sure that if you need cards, get your cards in their online store in the link in the description box below. Helps us out, and we really appreciate them. Also a reminder, if you haven't already, please like this video. Subscribe to our channel, check out all of our other awesome content, including our deck techs, other episodes of Duel of the Peaks, including the entire of Season 1, if you have a whole day to spend watching gameplay. Also, make sure to go like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and make sure to stay up to date with all of our videos. Thank you guys so much, and we will see you on the next episode. See you guys, looking forward to it. You know what, uh, Peter, you know what would have been better than blowing up one of Caleb's lands? Mm -hmm. Blowing up all of Caleb's lands. (laughs) Yeah, I agree.